Thank you for joining us today on this episode of the Faith in Real Life podcast, where we're continuing the journey of sacraments and another one on healing. Last week, we talked about reconciliation, and this week, we're going to the physical matter of the anointing of the sick. Millier, um, this is a great subject today. It is. I think it's really, it's an important sacrament that doesn't get a whole lot of press, but no. still, it is one of our beautiful sacraments. Of well, I remember faith. when I was a kid that it seemed to get lumped in that it was just the last rites. Right. Like you only thought right. about it that was somebody that was close to death. Right. And, and when that oil came in the hospital room, people usually got a little panicked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Like I didn't even know you could get it more than once. Like yeah. I just thought like that, that was the end of it. But, but this is important for us to understand in our faith because uh, the faith and real life aspect of this sacrament is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Have you ever been with anybody that received uh, not just anointing of the sick, but last rites? I was, yes, I was with my mom Mm. and um, it was a beautiful experience. And you, you know, I could just really see the visible spirit. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. I was blessed one time, uh, had a really good friend of mine that was uh, dying. I mean, there's no other way to say it, a brain cancer. And uh, we went to see him in hospice and I went with a priest friend of mine and he gave him, you know, his final rites and it brought me so much peace. You know, you knew that Christ was in the room and like you said, the spirit was so evident, Mm -hmm. you know, that God is at work in these sacraments. And, and, And that's just so important for us to understand that this relationship of faith that we have and the beauty of Catholicism is for us to understand that there is so much for us to feel and to hold on to that provides us a tangible image of Christ in our life. Right. Yeah, it is. It's truly a matter of really us understanding that in, you know, in these sacraments, we are really uniting ourselves with Mm. Christ. Yeah. In that unification, going back to covenant, we've talked about it in all of them, that this covenant allows us Uh, to see Jesus as he was when he walked the earth, right? You know, and we'll talk a little bit about today about where the anointing of the sick uh, comes from. We'll talk about how in the Old Testament, what the the rule of thumb was uh, for those who were experiencing illness. We'll once again talk about why we do what we do in the Catholic Church and and why some of the different um, oils and, and prayers are used and how they relate back to Christ. And then what do we actually receive in the sacrament? Mm-hmm. And I think that that's how we need to look at everything that we talk about in the sacraments. As Christians, and especially as Catholics, we should understand the what, uh, the why, the how, and then what the production is you know, of it is, what it produces in our life and how it unites us more closely with Christ and and his grace. Right. I think that, you know, there's nowhere uh, in any other sacrament really are we more inherently bound to the mystery of suffering than in the anointing of the sick because it really reminds us of life's fragility um, and the hard facts of our mortality. Yeah. For me, one of my most emotional, most emotional masses every year is when they do the anointing of the sick. Mm -hmm. And to me, okay, so usually what will happen, and I don't know how they do it at your church or if you haven't been in a while, maybe you haven't seen this, but usually what will happen at our home parish is that the priest will invite everybody who needs to receive the anointing of the sick to stand. Well, to sit on the aisle. Yeah, or sit on the aisle. Mm -hmm. So those who can stand do, and and those who, who can't are on the aisle. And then uh, usually there will be music and the priest goes around. Number one, from that, from the first point on. So I have to give this from two perspectives. Number one, I used to watch and say, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to stand. Mm -hmm. That was always my first prayer was that I would watch all these people that stood and I would say, thank you, Lord, that my family doesn't have to stand. Uh, I'll explain in a minute why I do have to stand now. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, but... Then secondly, I was always in awe of the older generation or those who were very sick, who mustered all of their strength Mm -hmm. to stand for this sacrament Mm -hmm. and to receive it. That's how deeply they believed. It wasn't like, I'll just sit here and wait for father to come, but it was, Mm -hmm. I want to offer myself. Yeah. 
It is, it is a beautiful mass to attend and to watch. And I, I remember a couple times ago, there was a young, there was a mother that had a young daughter that had some special needs, and, and she stood with her. Mm. And as I watched, uh, it was actually Father Adam uh, put his hands on her head. The little girl grabbed his pinky and just had her hand around it. Aww. It was so sweet. Just yeah. a beautiful sight. Well, and we, we watched that. And, you know, weeks ago we talked about how people stand and watch baptism mm -hmm. and the joy that mm -hmm. comes upon their face. And, and I really hope that as you're at your home parish or when you witness this, that you really become immersed in, as you said, the Holy Spirit is present. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I do have to stand now. Uh, many people that follow our daily shows or have known me in ministry for years know that um, I suffer from clinical depression and uh, it's a, a product or a byproduct of fibromyalgia. Uh, so the pain that I have throughout my body and just certain days and it's caused by a myriad of different things, but it's, it's a very debilitating, uh, aspect, but it comes from your brain. And, uh, so I do stand every year to receive that anointing of the sick. And at first I didn't want to stand because mm -hmm. I thought there are more people that are more sick than me. Why should I stand? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, why would I ever refuse God's grace? Right. And so, uh, I do stand and I even invited my daughter to stand because she suffers from migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the power of God is healing and, and maybe it's not going to happen physically for us, mm -hmm. but it gives us the ability to endure or as the catechism of the church says that it unites us more intimately with the passion of Jesus Christ. Right. Absolutely. And so if Jesus could endure all that pain and all that suffering, then we can endure it too because he gives us that ability to be witnesses to that. Um, so I'm not ashamed to stand for it anymore. I, I do what I need to do because I want to receive that. And I think that we all should too. Um, because in, in the Old Testament, if you were sick, that was just viewed as a curse. Right. In, in the Old Testament, if you were sick, it was like, man, there you're you're a leper. Or you, your parents, you know, remember the blind man. The, he heals mm -hmm. the blind man and the, the apostles say, well, Lord, who is it that sinned, him or his parents? Mm -hmm. The dude was just blind. Right. Nobody sinned. He right. just, he was blind. Right. And so they were second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. But Christ changed all that, right? Yeah, and I think, too, you know, understanding that, you know, in, you know, so fast forward to, you know, the New Testament, then, you know, Jesus is the one that came to the sick you know he didn't mm -hmm. move away from the crowds when they were coming to him for healing he moved into the crowds yeah. um and so in that we know that he is united with us in that suffering right and, and there is you know even in the old testament you know we have some healing that that we see when you know the people have turned away from god and the snakes are biting everybody and mm -hmm. and then they put the serpent on the stick the bronze serpent and and it's put before the people and they're healed, right? right. The, All that those, look at the serpent, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think that for us that, you know, because Christ gives us this living example, that what we need to, to deeply realize why we need the sacrament is because of what sickness can do to us. Mm -hmm. You know, even in the, in the traditions of the church and in our beliefs that, Sickness has an ability to control us in a way that we need to be healed from so that we don't become somebody we don't want to be. On the days where, you know, my ailments are off of the charts or I'm in pain or it causes depression, I mean, there are days where I turn inward, right? Or I am less than, I don't know, charitable, I guess you would say to my wife mm -hmm. because I'm just irritated right. and I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being a burden. I begin to lose patience and I become all these things that I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they just aired a couple weeks ago, the documentary on Robin Williams mm -hmm. and his uh, brain disease that caused him to commit suicide. Right. He had become so distant from who he was originally and had lost faith and became so delusional because of this disease, his dementia in his brain mm -hmm that he ultimately took his life. Right. Now I'm not saying whether he had Catholic anointing or, or what that would have changed for him, but mm -hmm. 
that is why this sacrament is important. Well, and I'm, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because they have changed, you know, the Catholic view on suicide, especially, Correct. you know, it, it is, if it is a disease of the mind that robs the person of life, it's not the person themselves committing murder. Right. Um, and that's why it's so important too. you know, many people stand with physical, you know, needs and healing for that the anointing masses, but it's just as important to go for mental healing, you know, right. for spiritual healing. You know, so many people suffer silently or that we don't know sure. from, you know, mental issues or addictions. And um, and that is all part and parcel, too, with, you know, being anointed in that sickness. Well, and for me, one of my, the, the way that I found out that I even had this disease was that I went through a period of about seven months of chronic fatigue. Mm. And at the very beginning, I could only stay awake about four hours a day. Wow. And I, I felt like, though, that... I had to go back and apologize to people and explain my illness to them because there were times that you'd be talking to me, not you personally, but someone would be talking to me and I could not comprehend their conversation. I was so tired mm -hmm. that I couldn't process what they were saying to me. Mm -hmm. So maybe they thought badly of me. Maybe they thought I was just being arrogant or distant or whatever it might be, but mm -hmm. I really felt bad and I felt that need to tell people. So there are many people suffering. And so because someone stands, uh, it doesn't mean that they're dying instantly right. because I did have people the first time I stood, they came up to me and they're like, I never knew. I'm like, never knew what? And they're like, I just didn't know you were so sick. <laughs> and I was mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I'll be here for a little while, I mm -hmm. think. But, you know. But it is. I mean, there is anointing for... Um, you know, let's talk about you, you, you know, it's not just for the dying, it's for if you're going to maybe have a surgery mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. a serious procedure, um, like you said in the beginning, it, it, is a, it is a sacrament that we can, we can receive more than once. And for like different things. Reconciliation and Eucharist, these are our three healing sacraments that we can get, you know, repeatedly. Right. And, uh, and obviously, you know, if, if the condition changes or an illness worsens, you can get anointed again. So that is the beauty of these sacraments of healing is that they, that we are not one and done. It, right. you know, Christ sort of surrounds us in our illness and allows us to get the sacrament if, you know, things turn for the worse. And you reminded me that, you know, these sacraments are available to us when we've reached our limit. Oh, right. There's that limit, limit theology when, you know, when we do find ourselves up against a limit, you know, against the, any more capabilities that we simply cannot go on, it, it does force us to turn to God. Yeah. And to look to him for that healing presence in our life that we need. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, any time that we offer ourselves or we lay it at the foot of the cross, it could, you know, it could be for a matter of things. It could be the grief or the loss of a loved one or a sin that, you know, we had to really have reconciled that mm -hmm. we get to that limit and we say, Lord, I, I can't do this anymore. And, right. and we might cry out. And, and you have to remember, um, you know, even if you're not Catholic, uh, or you've been distant from the Catholic Church, you can always call a priest and ask him to work with you on whatever situation that you're dealing with. Right. That if you're listening to this podcast and you say, well, I'm not Catholic, but I really need to be reconciled for my sins, or mm -hmm. I do have an ailment, and I do believe that this man, uh, this human being, is able to, to call down the Holy Spirit in a way that heals me like Christ, pick up that phone and, mm -hmm. and call a priest or call, you know, call somebody at the parish and ask for a parish priest because you might be amazed, uh, not might, let me rephrase that. Yeah. You will be amazed at what the Lord does, even if not in that moment, mm -hmm. but what begins to happen in your life. Right. And I, I agree. I know that, you know, so many times, um, our uh, our sickness, uh, the the sacraments, they really they come in these times of our limits and of our desperation. And um, you know when we are sick, you know and and suffering, and it just the the sacraments come in their power. And mm. like you say, you know we may not have, you know I mean often people will pray, you know for someone that's sick or not, you know for their cancer to be healed, and 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 then they'll come to me and they'll say, well why wasn't my you know mother healed and why did they die? And I said, you know they're healed. Right. They just didn't like the way he healed them. Right. You know, they're free. They're free from pain and suffering. Yeah. You know, they're not on this earth in that way now. But, uh, but again, there is that, there is that grace, you know, that is bestowed on well, all I, of us through these sacraments. And I don't want to ruin it for anybody. Sorry if I do, but I just watched the movie. I still believe. Have you mm -hmm. seen it yet? No. 
No. Do you want me to ruin it for you? Well, uh, well I, I, I know the story. Okay, so know so if you know the story, I didn't know the whole story. So yeah. I'm watching this movie, uh, but it's about, um, oh my gosh, help me with his name. Jeremy, uh, Camp. Jeremy Camp. I almost said Chris Tomlin. Uh, <laughs> but it's about Jeremy Camp and the song that he wrote called I Still Believe and about the sickness of his first wife. I didn't know she dies, mm-hmm. right? So I'm watching this movie. And well, I think first wife would be your clue. Well, but they didn't say that. I mean, I, I'm telling the audience that. But I'm watching this movie, and there's a point where in her cancer, stage four cancer, she says, I'm healed. Oh, my gosh, it's gone. She goes, I just feel warm inside. The cancer's gone. I'm healed. And so he runs to get the doctor, and she dies. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, like, it took me, I have goosebumps telling you that, but I, I'm like, what just happened but in our belief she was Mm -hmm. god healed her in that moment to give her the strength to express and she was so faithful that she was going home Mm -hmm. you know and so uh this aspect of the anointing of the sick i always say that if we could have one moment with christ we would take it Mm -hmm. and this is a moment to walk with christ and and you can talk a little bit about that in your minute today that um you know this ca- this aspect of the catechism of the Catholic Church that you're going to share with us really reminds us about Christ being present uh, in another sacrament for us to walk to walk with us during a moment of grief. So let's just get right into Millie's minute. Well, the Catechism of the Catholic Church 1505 says, Moved by so much suffering, Christ not only allows himself to be touched by the sick, but he makes their miseries his own. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases, but he did not heal all the sick. His healing were signs of the coming of the kingdom of God. They announced a more radical healing, the victory over sin and death through his Passover. On the cross, Christ took upon himself the whole weight of evil and took away the sin of the world, of which illness is only a consequence. By his passion and death on the cross, Christ has given a new meaning to suffering. It can henceforth configure us to him and unite us with his redemptive passion. We're never closer to Jesus than in our suffering, but a suffering that should not be wasted. There is a redemptive power in offering up our suffering for others. It brings redemption to the church and to the world in the grand scheme of the mystery of faith. Offering up our suffering is a way to truly walk in our true faith for salvation of the world. Mm. Walk in our true faith. You know, faith is easy to have when things are good mm. or we're healthy. Mm-hmm. But it's when the storm comes that right. Christ shows us the the ultimate path and right and his healing and what he did. That even if people couldn't get to him and the woman that would touch his cloak mm. or the centurion who right. believes so much that the servant is healed right that we still re- say that for our you know re- our cat you know the eucharist we say yeah. you know not worthy to enter under my roof yeah uh the willingness to heal the paralytic because his friends believed oh yeah you know this is how, where we pray in this anointing where somebody says well you know i want to have my father anointed but i'm not sure if he's a believer um or he kind of believed or maybe he didn't go to church but because you believe mm-hmm. um And I remember one time when you were reading that, I was thinking about in the Eucharist, uh, I was praying one time and I said, Lord, uh, bring me closer to you than I've ever been. And then I thought, well, I don't want to die yet. So like I I had to change that real quick. I was like, 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 here, I meant here, Lord, you know, (laughs) on this Uh, side of heaven. Yeah. But this humanness, this, Mm -hmm. this human nature of what Christ took on. Uh, is really amazing. And that's where the human senses again come in for us. Um, and there's rituals. There's, there's aspects of, once again, in a sacrament, we, we have oils and, and there is a specific set of prayers that the priest reads. And, and these are all things that fall in line with the tradition of the church. Um, so, yeah, so what are some of the ways that the human form of healing that we experience in the anointing of the sick mirror Christ. Well, if we remember, you know, the uh, the sacraments are are both um, matter and form. So if we look back into some of the ways that Jesus healed, uh, you know, he used mud. 
um, you know, to heal a blind man. Right. Also spittle. Um, you know, he, you know, put his fingers in his ear. So there was a physicality of his anointing, if you will, right. you know, the precursor to our oil. And, um, you know, he really healed in both matter and form. So mirroring that to our, you know, oil now that we have, what, what that they use in the anointing of the oil. And we discovered the other week it was bal- balsam, balsam, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we had asked um, production a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. About what so, the question was. so we are, I mean, it is bequeathed to the church this, um, you know, if you look at acts, how many times mm, that, um, mm-hmm. the word healing is used in there and, uh, and in the church and in its sacramentality, it is a healing church. Right. And, um, and even like, if you look at all the times it says, do not fear. And we look at that and say, well, do not fear, you know, uh, you know, evil or, you know, this or that, but you know, we don't think about it as death, you know, do right. not fear death. And I think that's the ultimate, you know, the ultimate thing that when we say do not fear, um, we are closest, um, when we are in that, you know, that state when we're closest to being with the father. Well, in a couple of weeks ago, we had the gospel about, um, Jesus healing, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. Right. And I just did a talk on spiritual warfare and I talked that, you know, when Jesus came to heal all these people, the demons said that you are the son of God. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, they know that Christ is present even before we do. Right, right. Right? Right. So we have to remember that Christ knows our need. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he's just waiting for us to show up so that he can be fully united with us. And I, w- I want to read this from uh, the catechism. This is, uh, you know me, I love the catechism. You, you love the catechism. Bill, your husband, loves the catechism. Yes. We do <laughs> we Bible study individual together. individual copies. Well, you know, he's, uh, he's the only one. I give him extra bonus points because he can always <laughs> read from it. Uh, but this is uh, paragraph 1504. And uh, I love this. This is under the heading of Christ the Physician. Mm-hmm. Um, it says that often Jesus asks the sick to believe. He makes use of his signs to heal, spittle and the laying of hands, mud and the washing. The sick try to touch him, for power can come forth from him, and he healed them all. And so in the sacrament, Christ continues to touch us in order to heal us. Mm -hmm. This humanness, everything that we do in the church, this isn't like, and I've said this before, but it isn't like a bunch of guys got into a room and said, hey, wouldn't it be neat if we just touch people? And that was a way that we healed them. Right. It's like they take scripture. Our church fathers took scripture and through the power of the Holy Spirit discerned what is the way that these tangible moments of Christ being in our life can be given as a gift to each person. Right. A free gift. Right. Grace. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's why we need to remember that these, you know, these sacraments are apostolic, which is just a fancy way of saying they come down from the, you know, the apostles that were, that, that was handed down from Jesus, you know, all these teachings and all these healings. And like I said, you know, you look through Acts and all these other areas of the Bible where they, the the mission and the ministry was healing. Right. And and I, I love uh, the story that you uh, told me one time about when you were going to have a Oh. procedure done <laughs> yeah i was gonna have um i was having back surgery and one of our friend uh priest friends knew you know knew i was gonna have it he said yeah. you know you can get anointed before a surgery and i'm like well you know it's not that ser- serious <laughs> but i was like well maybe i should <laughs> so um so i did i went you know back in his office and he was putting on the alb and he's like wait let's see if this is inside i was like, yeah make sure it's not inside out i'm sure that has an effect on the uh on the blessing right. i don't want to go the other way so right. um but yeah i have had um an anno- that anointing when i did have surgery and it was you know very successful but it is it is there for us to have that spirit of grace Mm. to you know to endure the illness to endure the suffering or to prepare us you know for you know for death for imminent death well the preparation of the journey is huge and i and i did say at the beginning that sometimes we used to refer to this as last rites and i know that with last rites that this can even take place of the the healing that comes forth in the sacrament of reconciliation right. that if somebody's not able to have confession it's kind of an all encompassing um mm-hmm. final prayer and and here's what uh, again going back to our catechism number 1523 says this about preparation for the final journey it says if the sacrament of the anointing of the sick is given to all those who suffer from ser- serious illness and infirmity even more rightly 
it is given to those at the point of departing this life. So it is called sacramentum exuentium, the sacrament of those departing. Mm -hmm. You like my uh, Latin there? Yeah. All right. The anointing of the sick completes our conformity to death and the resurrection of Christ, just as baptism began it. So beautiful. It completes the holy anointings that mark the whole Christian life, that of baptism which sealed the new life in us, that of confirmation which strengthened us for the combat of this life. This last anointing fortifies the end of our earthly life like a solid rampart for the final struggles before entering the Father's house. Right, and we talked about that earlier in preparation. I said, you know, these sacraments are wound so beautifully through the entire course of our life. And so I think about this. In the sacraments of all the sacraments, that we have this communion of saints, of Mm -hmm. believers who have gone before us. Mm -hmm. And not only do we dine with them in the Eucharist, but they're all there to greet us when we're on our final journey home. It's kind of like that end scene of Titanic Mm -hmm. where she's hallucinating before she dies and there's all the people waiting for her. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that Leonardo DiCaprio is not there yet, but (laughs) there's all these people waiting. And I think about that, like so many people have had near death experiences Mm -hmm. and they describe the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we have Catholic Mm -hmm. prayers, you know, the, um, chaplet of divine mercy and people wear scapulars and we have all these different uh, aspects of the Catholic faith that we believe will give us a peaceful death. Right. And that is what anointing does. Right. And so, you know, when you were talking about, you know, that catechism, it brought to mind, you know, there is a specific prayer that they say at anointing and it, it is through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. Mm. Save you and Chills. raise you up. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's a, it's, there's such richness in our, in our sacramental rites. And we're blessed to have that. And, and so we, we do have to go to it. Uh, you know, we talked about reconciliation last week and about how few times we go per year or per decade mm-hmm. or whatever it might be. And these are all at our disposal because the ultimate product, let's just say for lack of a better word, is the peace Mm. that we receive. Mm -hmm. The benefit. That's the the grace. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. This is what we receive through this anointing. Mm -hmm. So even though our struggle continues, Mm -hmm. I said at the very beginning that it unites us more intimately with the passion of Christ, Mm -hmm. that even as we suffer, if we can suffer as he did, Mm -hmm then the anointing is working. Or as St. Therese of Lisieux said, if I make joy of my suffering, doesn't it cease to exist? Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll enjoy. And, you know, the speaking of quotes, there's uh, Mother Teresa's quote that says, remember pain and suffering have come into your life, but remember pain, suffering, and sorrow are but the kiss of Jesus, mm. a sign that you have come so close to him that he can kiss you. Wow. Yeah, it is, it is a beautiful thing if in the free will of accepting this suffering that we can accept it being united with Christ and his passion. And I, I always think, you know, I joke about like people complain or I complain, you know, some, it's like, you know, I, I was teasing my son the other day because he was complaining about something. I was like, you know, were you on the cross? You know, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so I think, and I had talked about that in one yeah, of my mom, conversations. Yeah, and they're starving kids you know, in other countries. I, I think get to it. myself, you know, uh, we we go through pain and suffering, but I and I know many of the martyrs went through the same pain and suffering, but but very very few of us will ever experience half of the suffering that Jesus did. Right. For us. Right. For yeah, for no reason of his own, and for the betterment of humanity but to free us from our sins and to open the gates of heaven. And I often think about that with my kids. Like, as they're growing up, I would take on all the suffering if they could live a life free of the pain. Not just physically, but mentally. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's when we become united with Christ in such an intimate way that we would be willing to take on suffering for a loved one Mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't have to. And that's what the Father does for us. 
through all the gift of his love and his mercy and his grace offered to us through these sacraments is it's his offer you know take you know put my my you know put yourself on my yoke you know take let me take your burden right you know it, it's just it's that constant offering of grace from right. the father to to alleviate our suffering well and if, if you even closed your eyes usually what they'll do is they put the oil on uh, I think it's your eyes and your hands and your lips. Mm-hmm. I, I forget because sometimes I get confirmation confused mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. with that. But, you know, you, you have your palms open. Mm-hmm. And I always say that, that, that I love when you pray with your hands open because you're receiving and giving. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you, you look down after and you can see the oil. But if you imagine, as you just said, Christ kiss, he doesn't want to see us suffer. Mm-hmm. God doesn't do anything to us to give us some sort of pain because he wants it. The test is uh, just life itself. Mm -hmm. The test is playing the hand that we're dealt and finding a way to overcome. But he says, you don't have to do this alone. Mm -hmm. Let me come to you and let me be with you in the process. Right, absolutely. And so this anointing is our opportunity in the sacrament to once again give ourselves in the covenant so that he can come to us and send the Holy Spirit to heal us in the way that we can be through his will. Right. If it be uh, physical healing, we'll receive it. If it's just mental endurance, mm-hmm. then we'll get that too. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's another beautiful uh, aspect of this sacrament of healing that closes out that aspect of the sacraments. And over the next two weeks, we'll finish out this talk with the sacrament of marriage and holy orders, which we kept for the last because those are a union Mm -hmm. to be witness to the church, one for a ordained religious to do it uh, by marriage to church, Mm -hmm. and the other for two, um, for a man and a woman to come together. The mission work. Yeah, and uh, and and be united that way. So, um, Millie, what is your final thought today about the sacrament of the anointing of the sick? I just love the thought of not letting our suffering go to waste. Mm. You know, to offer it for another, you know, to, to accept it as God's will and to use it for the betterment, you know, just to send that saving power out to the world. I like that. Don't let your suffering go in vain. And so whatever it is that you're dealing with, uh, there is a God who loves you. There is a God who wants to heal you and need you to step up. And if you need that sacrament of the anointing of the sick, uh, like I said before, make sure that you call a priest, make sure that you find a way to receive that gift of God. And if you don't have access to a priest and you're in your final days or moments, um, call upon God in any special way that his heart uh, or your heart is joined with his heart and that he will know you better than you even know yourself. Uh, So before we end today, as always, I have to thank our sponsor of this podcast for these last, uh, let's see, we're on episode 117. I had to look at my board. Uh, But the Jess and Lily, a Gifts from Above Foundation. Uh, Since the beginning of our podcast, they've been our sponsor, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for their uh, benefactor gift. And so uh, as we move forward, and looking into new seasons and new episodes, we would love if you would consider uh, being a sponsor of this podcast. If it is one that affects your life or one that you feel people really need to hear, not only uh, if you can donate uh, monetarily, but also by sharing it with those that you love. And for more resources or previous episodes of this podcast and a lot of other faith-filled inspiration, you can go to faithandreallife.com on that website and it'll have everything that you need uh, in order to find it there. So I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm a little low-key today, but I think that this, this sacrament uh, reminds me some, from some of the grief that I've experienced lately mm. and reminding me that uh, I've forgotten about the beauty of suffering uh, recently. Yeah. And uh, so I have that reminder, and I think that... Uh, I think that it's going to do special things for me, and I hope it does special things for you too. So God bless you, God keep you, and I pray that he will meet you everywhere that you desire him throughout this week. Amen.